Good evening and welcome to another wonderful CCPL, Carroll County Public Library event. Uh, we have a great author event for you planned. But before we get into that, um, we want to take just a moment and recognize a couple of people who helped to make part of what has made the Finksburg Branch Library so wonderful. So in the spring of 2021, Laura and Dave Callahan approached the library with an idea. They wanted to increase the public's awareness and the use of the beautiful library space at the Finksburg Branch, especially the gardens with a grant. So in May, we began working on this wonderful garden grant. Since that time, Finksburg Library has been able to install a new set of honeycomb-shaped shelves, provide backpacks with wonderful garden-centric activities, host family programs in the gardens that focus on native plants and pollinators, and much more. In June of 2021, CCPL placed the Thomas Sterner sculpture, Life of a Seed, on permanent display at Finksburg. In the two years of this grant program, numerous children and families have discovered the treasure that is the Finksburg Library Gardens. So tonight, as we come to the end of our grant program, it seemed an incredibly appropriate time to celebrate the impact of this gift and say thank you. Oh, hold on, we're gonna have to restart. Okay. She's only partially visible on the screen. On your screen out there? Out there, there's like a large, like it looks like some sort of computer, like, were you just looking at like the settings or something wrong because it was blocking part of her? No, I wasn't. Yeah, it was like visually, it was blocked. What I'm hearing is people can't hear the audio, but the mic's okay. Do we need to move the mic? Do I need to move closer to the mic? <laughs> That's, I mean, I can. Yeah. I mean, it's still coming up. Not sure. I can speak louder too. I used to teach fifth grade. I can speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 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 We're good. We're good. So the visual good. Okay. Pardon our technical difficulties. Technology is wonderful until it isn't. We're hearing back from folks at home that they can all hear now. Oh, wonderful. Okay, very good. So welcome to, uh, we'll go back to the beginning. Welcome to uh, another wonderful author event from Carroll County Public Library. Before we begin our author talk, we want to take just a moment to say thank you uh, to two wonderful friends of the library who have made uh, the Finksburg Branch very special. In the spring of 2021, Laura and David Callahan approached the library with an idea. They wanted to increase the public awareness and use of the beautiful library gardens at Finksburg Branch uh, with a grant. So in May, the work began on this wonderful garden grant. Since that time, uh, Finksburg Library has been able to install a new set of honeycomb shaped shelves, provide dozens of backpacks filled with garden centric activities host family programs in the garden that focus on native plants and native pollinators, and much more. In June of 2021, uh, the library installed the Thomas Sterner sculpture, Life of a Seed, on permanent display at the Finksburg branch. In the two years of this grant program, numerous children and families have discovered the treasure that is the Finksburg Library Gardens. So, as we come to the end of this grant program, it seemed an incredibly appropriate time to celebrate their impact of their gift and say thank you. So, Dave and Laura, if you'll come up here, we want to we, we want to uh, thank you with a gift. Um, and so, yes, we're sneaky okay. that way. Come on in. Um, so, I'll let you go ahead and have that. Uh, if you you want to open it, you if you want to, but it is a certificate for a lifetime membership to the Friends of Carroll County Public Library for both of you oh, to wonderful. say thank you. We will also be installing a lovely white oak tree in oh, the garden wow. in celebration of your your gifts and your continual volunteering at the library and making the gardens such a great place to be. So thank, thank you. you very much. Oh, thank you. And with that. I will turn things over to Laura, who is going to be our interviewer and our moderator for this for, for tonight's program. So very good, Laura. Thank you. Good evening. 
Welcome to the Homegrown National Park with Doug Callahan. I am Laura O'Callaghan, a Master Gardener and tonight's moderator. A special thanks goes to a Likely Story bookstore. They are offering a 15% discount on Dr. Talamy's books to everyone attending this event, whether in person or virtually, tonight through Sunday, July 16th. They are here this evening with his books, which are available for purchase in person or online. A special thanks to the Carroll County Public Library for hosting this event, especially Heather Owings, Christina Kirker, and Lisa Picker. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Doug, Douglas Talamy, a visionary in the fields of entomology, ecology, and conservation. He's professor of agriculture and natural resources in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. His research highlights the integral connection between plant, native plants and insects and how the loss of one impacts the other. Dr. Talamy envisions a new approach to conservation and the public is um, role in that equation but I will leave the explanations to him. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to the esteemed Dr. Talamy. Thank you very much, Laura. <clears throat> How do we switch to my screen share? Is it up there? Can everybody see that? I'm hoping that's a yes. <laughs> All right, I do want to talk about uh, Homegrown National Park. But before I do that, let's talk about this creature. Uh, it's actually a spider. I think it's designed to uh, look like a fecal sac. You know, when birds in a nest, the baby birds poop, they, they don't want to get the nest all messed up. So they make a little fecal sac and the parents pick up that sac and fly away from the nest and then drop it. And it usually splats on a leaf. And that's what that looks like. Of course, nothing wants to eat a fecal sac, so it's a good disguise. Uh, close up, you can see there are the legs. It actually is a spider. And at night, it really looks like a spider. It hangs down from its leaf. Now, it doesn't spin a web. It drops a single strand of silk uh, with one sticky glob of glue at the end there, and it goes hunting with that. Uh, and it actually succeeds. Moths usually fly in. They get caught on that sticky glob of glue, and the spider spins them around, wraps them up very quickly, and then has a very nice meal. And they catch moth after moth that way. And when they catch enough moths, they have the energy to spin a, um, an egg sac filled with eggs. And that's how the uh, spider overwinters. Uh, all the eggs are in that egg sac. And then it'll go hunting again. Now, it might, might seem like uh, this would be a bad way to catch moths. Why don't they make a big web like other spiders do? Uh, but it's actually a good way because it's not accidental that the moths are flying in there. These spiders. Uh, the bola spider are releasing sex pheromones uh, of particular species of moths. I wanted to see what the moth was uh, that was being caught in, in my yard, and it turns out it is the bronze cutworm. I found out by unwrapping all of those, those uh, moths that they caught. Of course, they're only catching male moths because uh, that, that sex pheromone is going to attract males. The males come in. They think that uh, they're coming into a female. They are coming into a female, but it's the wrong female. So I've got bronze cutworms in my yard because I've got caterpillars of the bronze cutworm and I've got caterpillars of the bronze cutworm because I've got goldenrod. Uh, that is the main host plant of that, that particular moth. I also have this beautiful moth, the dot lined white because I've got oaks, particularly white oaks and because I don't rake their leaves away. There's actually a cocoon of the dot lined white in this leaf litter right there. It's right there. And if you enlarge it, it's right there. Now, of course, nobody would ever see that when you're raking leaves. Uh, so when you rake leaves away, keep in mind, you're also raking away the life that is associated with those leaves. I have the evening primrose moth in my yard because I've got evening primrose. And I've got evening primrose because I planted it particularly to catch that moth. The moth comes, it spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but these guys are always very cute. I also have zebra swallowtails because I've got pawpaws, which I planted so that I could have zebra swallowtails. That's the only host plant of that particular beautiful butterfly. It would take me uh, a week more than that to describe all the species that now call 
uh, our property home because of the plants that we have put there. It would not take me very long to describe the, the life that's associated with this particular property, which is very typical of what we have out there. There's no goldenrod, so there's no bronze cutworms, which means there's no bola spiders. There's no white oak, so there's no dot line whites. There's no evening primrose, so there's no evening primrose moth. There's no pawpaws, so there's no zebra swallowtail. Again, there is very little that can live in a typical landscape, uh, our typical suburban landscapes. And we've got 135 million acres of typical residential landscapes in the US. Uh, and that's why we see headlines like this on a regular basis. The insect apocalypse is here, talking about global insect decline. North America has already lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. Not a prediction, they're already gone. As a matter of fact, two thirds of Earth's wildlife is already gone. One million species face extinction, according to the UN. 40% uh, of the Earth's plants face extinction. We could talk for hours about these types of, of predictions, which is why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write The Sixth Great Extinction. Uh, it is a book about the sixth great extinction event that the Earth has ever experienced. We are in it right now. It's not something that might come. We are in the middle of it. Uh, and, and people are reacting to the, the loss of biodiversity, so much so that uh, some people are actually studying our reactions. One of them is Richard Hobbs. Uh, he uh, wrote a paper about, uh, he's actually comparing our reactions to the loss of biodiversity to the five stages of grief that we experience when we hear we have a terminal disease. First, there's denial. We certainly have a lot of denial going on out there. Then anger. I felt a little bit about, a little bit of that. Bargaining, you know, how can we make it better? Depression, also felt that. Uh, and then finally, acceptance. And I'm gonna fight back on acceptance because acceptance is equivalent to giving up. Uh, and giving up is not an option, folks. Uh, nature's not optional, so we can't give up and, and lose it. So I'm gonna propose a sixth step and that is action. And that is action to prevent this from actually happening. Now we do have parks, we do have preserves. Our national parks in particular were established primarily to preserve their exquisite scenery. They are gorgeous places. Uh, and Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to do in expanding the national park system. And he said, the establishment of the National Park Service is justified by considerations of good administration. So Teddy was, was patting himself on the back there as he well should. Of the value of natural beauty as a national asset and of the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenships. So in other words, our parks were created because they were pretty places for us to play in. They were not created for the purposes of conservation. And that's why we only have 3.6% of the US in national parks. These are little, little green areas here. And now when you go there, it looks like big areas, but it's only 3.6% of the US. Only 12% of the US is federally protected, which means 88% is not. And what's happening in that 88% uh, is appalling. Every 30 seconds, a football field worth of America's natural areas disappears to development. Development has got to be the most oxymoronic word in all of ecology. We've got 44 million acres of lawn. Uh, that's the latest statistic I've seen. That's an area the size of New England. We've paved over an area larger than Ohio, and that statistic is 15 years old, so who knows how much it really is now. Two million acres of golf courses. That's an area larger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined. Now we do have those parks and we do have preserves and people wonder why they are not big enough or why they are not enough to sustain the biodiversity that we all need. Uh, it's a good question. And the answer is that, oh, that's right, they are not big enough, they are too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down into a, a little habitat patch, and that's an exaggeration. You're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why is that? Well, because populations fluctuate normally. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. If you're a large population, that is this top line here, even in your down cycle, uh, there's enough of you so that when times get better, the population can increase quickly. But if you're a tiny population and those normal fluctuations, you often hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch and then you're gone. And unless you recolonize that habitat patch, that is called local extinction. And of course, 
Recolonization for a lot of creatures is very tough these days. Imagine a box turtle crossing uh, Route 95. It's just not going to happen. There are studies from all over the world, and some of them are quite lengthy, 100 years in length, that are telling us the natural areas that we have left on planet Earth are not large enough to sustain the amount of nature that we need to sustain us. Now, we typically use extinction as a metric of trouble, um, but uh, I don't think it's the right metric. If, if you only react when things are on the verge of extinction, it's like going to the doctor when you're, you're already dead. Uh, it's too late. We do have an extinction crisis for sure, but uh, we've got to beware of the loss of species that were once very common because those are the species that are doing the lion's share of, of uh, running ecosystems of providing the ecosystem function that we all depend on. By the way, that is the American chestnut it used to be the dominant tree uh, from uh, Maine all the way down to Georgia along the crest of the, the Appalachians. Um, it's functionally extinct at this point. Um, yes, there's genetic material out there, but not nearly uh, to the extent that uh, they were contributing a hundred years ago. This is the rusty patch bumblebee used to be one of the most common bees in the country. Um, not extinct yet, uh, but if you find one, it's a big deal because there's so few of them. So it's functionally extinct. Beavers, you know, beavers determine the hydrology of the entire country uh, before we hear, uh, Europeans came and essentially wiped out their, their populations. They still occur. They're actually uh, rebuilding in numbers in some places, but not nearly to the extent that they, they uh, once were here. Uh, and so the hydrology of the entire country has been changed. So what we're not talking, we're talking about defaunation as opposed to extinction. Defaunation is the real problem, the reduction in the abundance of species that were once common. It's local, it's pretty much everywhere. And unfortunately, we don't even notice it. And we don't even notice it because of a, a phenomenon called shifting baseline. We tend to think that things are the way the way they were when we were kids is the way they have always been because it's the only thing we've ever experienced. So for example, none of us alive today miss the passenger pigeon because it was already gone before any of us were born. It used to be the most common bird on the entire planet and its loss changed things considerably, but we don't notice that. So shifting baseline means that we are losing biodiversity, the biodiversity that sustains us without even noticing it. So what are we gonna do? Well, you know, the, new, the UN uh, has taken notice of biodiversity loss. Uh, they had a big conference in where Montreal uh, this recently this year. Uh, and they're working on, on re resolutions. This is one of the headlines that came out of that conference. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. We are negotiating whether or not we're going to protect uh, what keeps us alive on this planet. Um, so that's good that we're talking about it, but I'm not going to wait for the UN. Uh, Eo Wilson, of course, he died the day after Christmas two years ago. Uh, it's a terrible loss to the world of conservation, but he was very much uh, in tune to, to uh, the problem of biodiversity loss. And in 2016, this is the book that he wrote, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And in this very valuable book, he had one simple message. He said, look, folks, we've got to get serious about this. If we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. In other words, we're going to have to save nature on at least half of, of planet Earth. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Um, of course, to a conservation biologist, this is, this is good news. We'll just put uh, half the earth aside and all the things that are disappearing can be in that half and we humans can be in the other half and, and everybody will be happy. Problem is half of terrestrial earth is already in some form of agriculture. And I don't see us getting rid of that. And we've got 8 billion people and all of our, our uh, hardscape, our detritus, our highways and airports and houses and everything else in the other half. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So people are wondering, how can we actually achieve E.O. Wilson's goal? I think we can do it. And that's basically what I want to talk about tonight. I think we can realize his dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to achieve that goal. We're going to have to give up the idea that humans and nature cannot coexist. That has been our, our conservation model forever. Uh, we've tried to save areas uh, someplace where there aren't a lot of humans, uh, but where there are humans, 
no more nature. Um, that's, that's not the future. Um, we can coexist with nature. Not only is living with nature an option, I think it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservations worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. Now we need to turn that on its head and we need to save nature. We have to practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere these days. That means we have to practice conservation, not just in areas like this, but in areas like this as well. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but thrive. So a lot of people say, well, fragmentation is the problem. What we've done is take viable habitats and reduce them into little islands that are separated from each other. That is what fragmentation is. And if we connect those islands, create um, um, what we call them biological corridors that would allow plants and animals to move between those viable habitats, that will solve much of the problem. Um, and, and to a certain extent it will, but look, the viable habitat is still tiny. That means the populations within them are still tiny. So when they fluctuate, they still will disappear. We need to make more than biological carters. We make, need to make viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. Um, this is good. That's even better. So we have to take those areas outside of these, these viable habitats and turn them into viable habitats, restore them. So these, these lighter areas here would be where much of our agriculture and our cities and other places that are more difficult to restore are but there's an awful lot of area that we can put viable habitat back into. Remember, every bit of conservation we do outside of a, a viable habitat is going to help conservation inside that habitat. To achieve this though, we need a new attitude about property rights because look what's out here, it's all our private property. That's where we live, we work, we farm, we play. So we need a new attitude about property, uh, property rights. We've had this idea that we can do whatever we want on our property. It's we own that piece of earth and it's our right to do whatever we want with it. The problem is our yards are not like Las Vegas. We all know that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but what happens in our yards does not stay on our yards. And that is the problem. The way we, we uh, plant our yards, essentially our plant choices, the amount of lawn we have is going to determine um, how well that ecosystem functions and it's going to impact local ecosystem function everywhere around us, including all the people that live around us. That's because our properties are all part of local ecosystems. They're not separate from it. So whatever we do on our property impacts the entire ecosystem. Uh, let's just look at lawn as an example. The amount of lawn you have is gonna determine whether rain infiltrates or whether it leaves as stormwater runoff, carrying pollutants and herbicides and everything else with it. It's going to determine whether we're adding nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides to that local watershed, which ultimately ends up in our oceans. This is why we have dead zones uh, in, in the Gulf and all over the world, actually. The amount of lawn we have is going to determine how much carbon we are adding to the atmosphere every time we mow it. How we landscape is going to determine whether we're, going to, whether we're supporting pollinators or whether we're eliminating the resources that they actually need. It's going to determine how much carbon our property or it's actually pulling out of the atmosphere, sequestering, capturing, removing from, from uh, harm's way in the atmosphere and storing in the plants and the soil of our property. Our plant choices are going to determine whether or not we're, we're harboring ecological tumors like, like calorie pear that escape and, and actually castrate ecological function, become serious invasive species. And plant choice, uh, finally, is going to determine whether we're, we're, we're supporting the insects that support the local food web. In short, how we landscape is going to help determine how much life Earth can sustain. And that is an awesome responsibility. It's an awesome responsibility that homeowners, that landscape managers do not know that they have. But it also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis. There's a lot of us out there. And if we each contribute to this problem, um, I really do believe we can, we can help uh, mitigate it to a great extent. Again, why is that? It's because most of the country is privately owned. 78% of the country is, is owned by, by private landowners. Uh, that's over 100 million people. 85.6% uh, east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If each private landowner 
took conservation seriously, we would make a huge dent in the problem. So again, collectively, property owners are now the hope and the future of conservation. Back to lawn. It's the low-hanging fruit. It's the thing that is easiest to modify. And we've got, again, more than 44 million acres of it nationwide. Uh, and we need it, I know, to display our, our Halloween decorations and also because it is a it is a status symbol. But what if we cut that area of lawn in half? What if we replanted half of it in the plants that are actually going to contribute to ecosystem function? Let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres of lawn. We're going to cut that area in half. That gives us 20 million acres. This is what we're going to create homegrown national park out of, at least the beginnings of homegrown national park. And it's going to be a big area. It's going to be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres, so Homegrown National Park is going to be the biggest park in the country. I had this idea a long time ago, I don't know, 2006, 2007, as soon as I saw that figure about how much lawn we had, and I started putting it in my talks. And then finally, when I wrote uh, Nature's Best Hope, I created a chapter called Home Grand National Park. Uh, but it wasn't until I met Michelle Alfandari that, um, who actually, was just, she was a, um, had a, a branding marketing career in, in uh, Manhattan and had simply, had recently retired. Uh, she went to one of my talks, actually, because one of her neighbors uh, dragged her there. She was a perfect member of the non-choir. Uh, she did not know anything about biodiversity or about conservation, about the conservation, uh, the, the biodiversity crisis. But she came to one of my talks and she saw a, an opportunity. She came up to me afterwards and she said, you're not going to succeed unless you talk beyond the choir, unless you reach all the people who know nothing about it. And to do that, you've got to use social media. You've got to create a small nonprofit. You've got to do all these things. And I said, I don't do any of those things. And she said, well, I do. And I'm going to help you do that. And that's how Homegrown National Park, the nonprofit organization, .org, came into being. Uh, and what, what Michelle did was create uh, the map. Uh, and the object is to register your property on the map, um, the location, and the amount of area you're going to be a good, good steward of. Um, so here are the, the national parks that exist right now. The object is to turn it into that. Uh, it's a big goal, but we, we really believe that it is attainable. What are we asking? We are asking people to reduce the area in lawn. Lawn does not contribute anything to the ecological goals that we need to establish on our properties. We want to put more native plants that are going to establish those goals or, or reach those goals. Remove the invasive plants that are a major problem. Most of us do have invasive plants on our property and we don't even know it. And if, our, if we already are protecting some natural areas, we certainly want to keep doing that. Uh, there, there are real ecological products associated with homegrown national parks, significant increases in, in biodiversity. And I'll give you some examples of that in a few minutes. Measurable reduction in invasive species. Now, if everybody who owned property got rid of the invasive species on their property all over the country, we'd be 78% done we'd be 85% done east of the Mississippi. And that is a huge step forward. And it's something manageable because all you have to do is worry about your property. Um, if we convert our lawn into plantings like this or put some trees in there, that will create a significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. So we're gonna help climate change. We're going to start to transform areas outside of parks and preserves into viable habitat. Right now they are no man's land, but this is viable habitat. They're important sociological products too. National awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solutions are and that you are part of the solution, an important part of the solution. We're trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature's not optional. It is absolutely essential. And everybody owns responsibility to sustaining it because everybody needs it. Everybody depends on ecosystem function. We wanna convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action is even better. Uh, and we want to merge uh, the successful conservation that is being accomplished by existing national conservation organizations like Audubon and National Wildlife Federation and Wild Ones and, and uh, all the land conservancies that, that are out there, Sierra Club. We want to merge them into one visible that we call the MAP. Um, so that, you know, you've heard of the 30-30 the initiative. Um, 
first step one to achieving E.O. Wilson's 50, uh, 50 goal of preserving 50% of the earth by 2050. 3030 is preserving 30% of the earth by 2030. We are not going to do that unless we consider conservation that's happening on private property. So that's what this is all about. There's urgency to enacting the, the homegrown national park solution. Um, remember that 135 million acres in residential landscape? That's a big job. That's a big deal. So we all need to get to work uh, and we can do it. I really believe we can do it, but there are a few things that we need to learn. We need to internalize if we're going to succeed. There are four things that every single landscape needs to accomplish ecologically if we're going to reach uh, a sustainable relationship with Mother Earth. All of our landscapes have to support viable food webs. All of our landscapes have to sequester carbon, have to pull it out of the atmosphere and tie it up in the soil and the plants. All of our landscapes have to clean and manage the water. They all live in a watershed. And all of our landscapes have to support a complex community of pollinators. Lawn doesn't accomplish any of those things, which is why we're starting by reducing the area that's in lawn. We all got to accept that, that plant choice matters. The plants we choose are going to determine how we, we accomplish those goals. Uh, we're going to make it simple. There are only three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs. Remember what plants are doing. They're capturing energy from the sun, turning it into food through photosynthesis. Uh, that energy is in the, the carbon bonds of simple sugars and carbohydrates, which is the food that supports just about all the animals on the planet. So plants are making the food. Some plants contribute that food to local food webs. Some plants do not. We'll call them non-contributors. They make food, but they keep it to themselves. And there's some plants that actively remove food from local food webs. The best contributor uh, in most of the, the uh, North American ecosystems that we have out there is one of the oaks. Got 91 species of oaks out there and they're contributing more energy to local ecosystems than any other plant genus. A good example of a non-contributor would be uh, any of the ornamentals from, from Asia, um, like ginkgo, ginkgo biloba. You know, it's a beautiful ornamental plant, has a nice fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So the energy remains locked up in a ginkgo. It's not passed on to local food webs. Uh, and good examples of detractors would be those invasive species, again, from other of course, an invasive species of definition means it is from other, other uh, countries. Um, very few things can eat these uh, plants, and yet they move into our natural areas and displace the native plants that do support our local food webs. We also need to appreciate how important caterpillars are in local food webs. And people hear me talk about caterpillars all the time, and there's a good reason. They're the bread and butter of the terrestrial food webs that keeps life churning out there. They're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So they're enormously important. And if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And this is why keystone plants are so important because they support more caterpillars than any other type of plant. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. They are supporting most of the caterpillars. Just 14% of our native plants are supporting 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those terrestrial food webs. So I like to think of the keystone plants and the ecological houses that we're building as the two by fours that hold those houses up. They are the support system. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. How do you know what the keystone species are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the rank list of the most important plant genera in terms of supporting caterpillars will uh, pop up for your county. This is what a typical list looks like. Now I should cut it off because I ran out of space. They're much bigger than this, but oaks are typically at the, at the top, followed by cherries and willows and elms and, and other, other woody plants. These are the, the keystone uh, herbaceous plants Goldenrod's always way up there, native asters, uh, perennial sunflowers, uh, very good. Not only at supporting uh, caterpillars, goldenrods, for example, in the mid-Atlantic states support, um, what, 110 species of caterpillars. These are also the very best in terms of supporting specialist bees. So they're helping our, our uh, pollinator communities as well. And we have to accept that uh, it's not just caterpillars that are important. All of the insects are important. 
E.O. Wilson told us way back in 1987 that insects are the little things that run the world. And 90% of the insects that eat plants, insect herbivores, can only eat the plants from which, for which they have a very specialized evolutionary history. Um, they can only eat the plants that, for which they have developed the specialized adaptations that allow them to get around plant defenses. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. Now, we all know the monarch. We all know it's a specialist on milkweed. We are not going to save the monarch if we don't put the milkweeds back. Uh, but I don't know if you've thought about the fact that milkweeds are toxic plants. They're protected by cardiac glycosides, which is why we don't eat them. If we eat a lot of milkweeds, they will stop our heart. And they also have sticky latex sap. So when you break open a, a milkweed leaf, all the white goo comes out and it gums up uh, caterpillar mouth parts. When it's exposed to air, that white goo turns into a chewing gum type thing and it glues their mouth parts together. Well, monarchs have the adaptations that allow them to get around cardiac glycosides and to block the flow of sticky latex sap so they can eat that plant when most other animals can't. What's important to realize is the monarch is not specialist. 90% of the insect herbivores that are out there have the same type of specialized relationships with their host plants that the monarchs have with milkweeds. It has to become knowledge, uh, common knowledge that we need pollinators. Now we're pretty good with this. The pollinators get a lot of, a lot of press, um, probably for the wrong reason. Uh, you always hear that they, they, uh, we need pollinators because they, they pollinate a third of our crops. Um, it's not true. They pollinate about a 12th of our, our crops. So we need them everywhere, not just in agriculture. And I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. That's why I don't like the crop argument. Uh, we need pollinators because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Losing our pollinators is not an option. And we have to start to appreciate the ecological value of fallen leaves. We're not going to rake them away and throw them away as if they're as if they're trash. What do we call them? Leaf litter. They're not litter. We should call them leaf largesse. That's what Gene Ponzi and, and uh, St. Louis considers them. Leaves accomplish very important goals. They're transferring the energy the nutrients that the trees used this year back into the soil so the trees can use them again in future years. Those nutrients are all tied up in these leaves and when we rake them away, we're throwing away the nutrients. And when you do that for 50 years, you starve your trees to death. They're also pro uh, providing a blanket that protects the, the um, moisture level in the soil. Soil can, uh, protects, contains more species uh, underground than above ground. Um, and that includes all the mycorrhizal fungi, uh, that keep our plants alive. Extremely important ecosystem that is protected from erosion, from drying out by leaf litter. And of course, a lot of things live in leaf litter as well. And people say, well, I can't, I can't keep leaf litter in my, my uh, flower beds. Um, but you can, you can. The plants grow right through them. Now, you can't pile it five feet thick. But, um, you know, who was raking away the leaves in the old days? Nobody. You can have, have all these plants under your trees without getting rid of, of your leaves. And we have to realize how destructive light pollution is. Light pollution is one of the major causes of insect decline. It's also one of the easiest things to fix. All we have to do is take the white bulb out of our, our outdoor lights and put in a yellow bulb uh, because yellow bulbs, yellow wavelengths are not attractive to, to uh, nocturnal insects. So you replace your, your white bulb with a yellow bulb overnight, you can save millions of insects. And if you use a yellow LED, you can also save millions of dollars. And we've got to realize how destructive uh, mosquito fogging is. Uh, a lot of misinformation out there about mosquito fogging. Uh, the mosquito foggers tell you that it's okay because it's a natural product that they're fogging. And that, that is true. Uh, it's pyrethroids. That's the compound in chrysanthemums that evolved to kill insects. Um, but you know, cyanide is a natural product. Ricin is a natural product. Nicotine is a natural product. So being natural does not make it make it safe. They also say it only kills mosquitoes, and that's not even close to true. It kills all the insects it comes in contact with, all of the pollinators, all of the monarchs. As a matter of fact, that's the result of mosquito fogging uh, on the eastern shore of Maryland uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so big monarch kills are being reported all the time when people call in mosquito Joe. The in interesting thing is it doesn't control mosquitoes. Uh, it's too difficult to control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You have to kill 90% of them. And these mosquito fogers kill between 10 and 50%.
which is why they have to keep coming back and back and back. If you really want to control mosquitoes, and I get it, we do want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage and do it through mosquito dunks. That's biological control. This is, this is Bacillus thuringiensis, a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And what you do is you get a bucket and fill it full of water, put in a little handful of straw or hay, let it ferment for a couple of days. That becomes an irresistible brew to mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. The female mosquitoes will lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you put in a mosquito dunk uh, and the larvae nibble on it and they die. Um, so it's very effective. It only is targeted, it only kills aquatic dipter. And the only aquatic dipter in your bucket is a mosquito. And if everybody did this, uh, we could control mosquitoes without killing everything else. We want to start to appreciate how important small properties are. A lot of people have small properties. 82% of us live in cities on small properties. And we want all those people to participate as, as well. Uh, and if you have a really small property with no ground at all, you can use container gardening. Uh, container, there's a, a section on our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, about container gardening with native plants, uh, which is very effective for, particularly for pollinators. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and the biodiversity crisis. We can address both of those crises at the same time through conservation. The silver bullet is that conservation works. This is the Natusa grasslands. It's 3,800 acres in Illinois. There's 730 native plant species there. 180 species of birds have been recorded there. It used to be a cornfield. It's just one example of how we actually can put things back together again. Here's another example of what's happened at, at uh, uh, my house. I should say our house. My wife lives here too. Um, we have a, a property, it was a farm, part of a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots way back in the year 2000. We got one of those, those lots. It had been mowed for hay. It was a very old farm, been farmed for 300 years. Not much there. Uh, almost no trees at all, mowed for hay. So our, our job was to, to rebuild the ecosystem that was once there. Of course, when you take something out of mowing in, in this part of the country, what you're really mowing are the rootstocks of all the invasive species. Um, autumn olive and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and, and, and uh, miscanthus. You mow that over and over again. Of course, what you're mowing goes to the mushroom industry, so they don't care what it is. But when you stop mowing, this is what comes back. And that's what our 10 acres looked like when we actually moved in. It was this giant tangle of Asian vines. So it's, it's, it's daunting. And a lot of people just, just want to give up. Don't give up. That's Cindy. That's my wife. She got rid of it. Um, she got rid of it by being persistent, by starting at the corner and just moving forward. And, and fortunately, she, in, she enjoys it. But um, it is possible. Uh, it is labor intensive, but it is possible. You have to stay after it because the seed rain from all your neighbors who don't get rid of this stuff will keep coming back until they do control it. But this is what the property looks like uh, today, taken from the same perspective that I took the first, first one. We put a lot of the plants back. We've controlled the invasive species. And I have been counting the number of moss species that are now making a living on our property because we put the plants back. I've been doing it for the last six years uh, and I'm up to 1,113 species of, of moths that are here. That's diversity building, that's conservation simply because we put the plants back. And they're neat species, things like the chinkapin leaf miner, the skullcap skeletonizer, the neighbor, the little devil, the horrid zaley, the forgotten frigid owlet. How cool is that name? The scallop sallow, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, and yes, there's an implicit arches as well. The snowy shouldered eclaris, the grateful midget, the pink shaded fern moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagotis, the showy emerald, the green marvel, Harris's three spot, the bride, the eyed pectes, the tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth on their property? And this is one of my favorites, the spun glass caterpillar hundreds of other species um, that are now making a living at our property because we put the plants back. Now, I know what a lot of people are thinking, gee, you got all these caterpillars that are eating your plants. How come it's not defoliated? What's going to keep all these caterpillars in check? Well, we also have a lot of things that eat those, those caterpillars, a lot of things that eat those caterpillars. We've got 62 species of birds. We've recorded breeding on our property, and they eat hundreds of caterpillars every single day, particularly when they're, they're breeding. 
or when they're raising their young, we've got a lot of predators, insect predators, ambush bugs, assassin bugs, um, predatory stink bugs. This guy sat next to this aggregation of, of milkweed caterpillar and he ate one a day, um, I guess as a vitamin or something. But he, there were a lot fewer by the time he got finished. We've got parasitoids, hymenopter parasitoids. Uh, most of them are laying eggs in caterpillars and killing them. We've got other, other wasps that sting the caterpillars and carry them away to their, their uh, mud nests. Then they lay an egg on it. So the caterpillar is, is not killed, it's paralyzed. Uh, it's, this is nature's form of refrigeration. If the wasp killed the caterpillar, it would rot before the egg even, even hatched. But this way it stays nice and fresh and the larva can develop on that fresh caterpillar. And we've got other things that eat uh, not just caterpillars, but a lot of other insects like skunks and possums and raccoons, foxes. 25% of a fox's diet is, is insects. We've got uh, cute little tree frogs. We've got toads. We've got salamanders. We've got ringneck snakes. These are all insect eaters. And the cutest little gray tree frogs, which happen to be green when they're, when they're babies. And lots of other things on our property because we put the plants back. Okay, conservation works. But you know, our lawn goals are too modest. Most of our privately owned land is actually in small woodlots. It's in cropland or it's in rangeland. In Pennsylvania alone, we've got millions of acres of, of woodlots. There are 406 million acres of woodlots managed by private citizens throughout the country, not managed by logging companies. Uh, and that's a tremendous opportunity for conservation. But how those woodlots are managed is going to determine how productive they are. Now, they're, what are they being managed for? They're being managed for, for the production of wood. Uh, but you can do that. You can do that sustainably. There are now um, organizations like the Foundation for Sustainable uh, Forestry in Western Pennsylvania that will tell you how to do that. There's two kinds of, of uh, wood harvesting. There's high grade harvesting uh, where you take the best trees uh, and, and leave the rest. And there's worst first management where you take the worst trees and leave the best. High grade harvesting gives you a really good harvest once, then you're done. You're done for about 80 years. Worst first uh, selection, you take the, the smaller um, trees that are not being very productive. You take fewer of them and you do it regularly. It leads to higher yields over time indefinitely. The other thing you have to manage in woodlots are those invasive species. All of our woodlots are invaded by, by plants from Asia, escapees from our gardens, um, and much of them look like this. This is a natural area near me, White Clay Creek State Park. Uh, but to manage invasive species, we also have to manage our deer. Uh, and I know we have a lot of deer lovers out there, but the deer are shifting the competitive balance against the native species. They eat all the native species uh, and they leave the invasives, they don't like them any more than our insects like them. Um, and it's destroying the understory of, of our forests. It's destroying recruitment. This is the uh, a really healthy understory. I took this picture in the Great Smoky Mountains this, this spring, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, and the park rangers are there. And I said, where are your deer? How can you've got this understory? And he said, we have deer, but we also have bears and we also have coyotes and we also have bobcats. Uh, and that's enough to keep those deer in check. They don't have any managed hunts, but they kept the predators, enough predators to keep, keep the, uh, the forest intact. Um, so, of course, there's another serious uh, uh, downside to deer overabundance. Not only are they, are they wrecking recruitment in our forests and encouraging invasive species, but they also have created the Lyme disease dilemma. Does deer are an essential uh, part of the Lyme disease cycle. The, the deer ticks uh, actually mate on, on deer. Um, so how do we control deer? I'm not gonna uh, spend a lot of time on this, but we could put the predators back like they've done in, in the Smokies. Um, tough in, in some places. We can hire sharpshooters uh, that temporarily reduces deer populations in narrow places, but it's very expensive and a lot of people don't like it. Or we can create, uh, bring back market hunting. Um, that's what Bern Blossie at, at Cornell wants to do. Market hunting, of course, you get paid uh, for every deer that you shoot. You bring it to market, um, people will, will put it to good use. Uh, and there's motivation to, to uh, keep hunting. The market hunting worked really well in, in getting rid of all of those pesky bison and, and uh, passenger pigeons and, and Carolina parakeets and all the other things we got rid of through market hunting. So it would work with deer as well. What do we do in the meantime? 
well, this is what I do. I put cages around my, my plants so that uh, I, can, I can have trees. Otherwise, I would have nothing uh, because the deer eat them when they're tiny. Cropland. Got a lot of cropland out there. 410 million acres of, of cropland in, in North America. Um, that's what the green areas are. Uh, and of course, that's, you know, we're, we're raising our, our food there. So we're not talking about getting rid of the cropland, but how we treat that cropland can make a huge difference in the biodiversity that's associated with it. We can manage the roadsides productively. We can put hedgerows back. We can add prairie strips and we can limit neonicotinoid insecticides. The reason we've lost the monarch folks is because we have changed um, productive roadsides into lawn and agriculture throughout the Midwest and, and most of the country, as a matter of fact. This was the area that had uh, milkweeds and asters and goldenrod and, and uh, New York ironweed and all the other things that, that uh, protected our, our monarch populations and our native bee populations. Uh, and we, we got rid of it and, and, and put, put it into lawn. For, for no good reason. So uh, we can change this farming ethic to this. We can do this and people are starting to do it. Iowa is way ahead of, of us. So there's something like a thousand miles of roadway restored to uh, Iowan prairie um, right next to, to agriculture. Put the hedgerows back. Um, we took them out so that we could have huge machinery, but we can we can we took them out because it became a, a uh, I don't know, another farming ethic to, to do it. Uh, but we have to return them as multi-species uh, hedgerows, native hedgerows. Um, we did a simple study uh, just a few years ago comparing the caterpillar populations. Remember, caterpillars, the bread and butter of local food webs in hedgerows that are invaded with non-native plants like autumn olive and multiflora rose and compared caterpillar populations in hedgerows that are not invaded. And we found a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars in the invaded hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass of those caterpillars. The amount of energy that's available for, say, our birds. 96% reduction in bird food when you allow hedgerows to be invaded by, by non-natives. It's not trivial. Prairie strips, really productive thing. A great idea right in the middle of the corn and the soybeans. Um, perpendicular to the flow of water off of the land. It's obvious how they're going to help pollinators, but they also reduce topsoil loss by 95%. They reduce water pollution by 90% because it's intercepting those things before they leave the, the farm property. And you might say, well, the farmer's losing a lot of property. Is not. Uh, it gets it's supported by USDA um, CRP programs. So there's no financial loss there, but there's a huge gain in biodiversity. Then finally, uh, we've got to reduce our use of neonicotinoids, uh, particularly as seed coatings, particularly when they don't benefit agriculture at all. Neonicotinoids, by the way, are 7,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT was. 7,000 times more toxic. They are used preventively. In other words, they're used whether or not you have an insect problem. And most of the time, we don't. When you compare fields that use uh, neonicotinoids as, as seed coating, so all the pink seeds you buy, that's, that's a seed coating. Um, with fields that don't use uh, neonicotinoids, there's no increase in yield. So we're using these things for no reason. Only 5% of that seed coating is taken up by the plant. 95% washes off into our water systems where they're very persistent, or they blow away on dust where nobody has a clue what they're doing but I keep hearing people saying we're losing our grasshoppers. Finally, rangeland, the biggest chunk of land that's out there, 770 million acres are in rangeland. That's four and a half times the size of Texas. It can be used productively. Uh, we went, Cindy and I went to a, an experimental range in Nebraska. Those are cattle out there, that's not bison. These are sunflowers. Um, they were they were all happy. All the birds were there. All the insects were there. It was a productive range. Remember, all of our grasslands worldwide co-evolved with grazers. Grazers belong there. Grazers increase the diversity of these lands when it's not overgrazed. So we want to avoid overgrazing, and we want to keep the cows out of the water. The water systems that go through our rangelands are extremely important in terms of biodiversity. If the cows get in there, they eat the cottonwood, they eat the willow, they destroy the, the banks. They destroy the biodiversity associated with these rangelands, and it's very easy to keep them out. So there is something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches. 
And that is that whether or not they succeed is going to depend on the decisions that you and I make. I had a student in, in uh, one of my classes last year, Amanda Crandall, and she was writing on a, a final exam. She said, well, conservation is claimed to be managing species and habitats. What we're really managing is people. Uh, and that is true. This is, a, this is a, essentially a sociological problem. We are managing people. We're talking about changing our culture from an adversarial approach to nature to a collaborative one. And the question is, can we do this? Is that possible? Of course it's possible. You don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, a lot of people know there's, there's a lot of problems on planet Earth, but they feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can do all the things we just talked about. We can shrink the lawn, we can modify our lights, we can add a pollinator garden, we can remove invasives from our properties, we can add keystone plants, we can fire our mosquito, mosquito fire, we can join homegrown national park. It's easy for one person to really increase the productivity of their, their property. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. Get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. And if you don't own property, help somebody who does. So we hope that Homegrown National Park is going to provide the motivation and the guidance for millions of people to tackle these conservation challenges. How we act now is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. So thanks very much. Please register, get yourself on the map. Happy to take questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Tallamy. I would like to start with a question about oaks. Um, is there a difference uh, in value between the different oaks? Uh, well, that's a good question. We, we compared 16 species of oaks that occur in this area. Uh, and there are slight differences, but they're very, very slight. For the most part, uh, if an insect can eat one oak, it can eat the others. The white oak group had a slight advantage over the red oak group, but, but not much. The oaks that don't perform as well are the ones that are out of range. So, uh, for example, at my house, I've got a willow oak. It's above, it's, it's north of its, of its natural range. And it supports some things, but not as much as it would if it were down south where it belongs. Understood. So same thing for water oak. Okay. Um, if, uh, if you were going to plant, if you planted a, an oak, it mentioned in your book about oaks that it's good to plant two oaks. Um, but what if you don't know what species it is? Does it matter? No, and it doesn't have to be oaks either. It's, it's a matter of, of creating a root matrix. So they can be different species entirely, you know, oaks and, and maples, it doesn't matter. We want the roots to intertwine the way they would in a forest, which stabilizes them. So two or even three create a little, a little um, grove of, of trees. Okay. So uh, and, how far away would you um, how far away would you put these trees? Um, I would put them about ten feet okay. apart. Um, so they they grow big, uh, and and that's pretty close for for a big tree. But it will uh, interlock those roots, and then then when the storms come, and they're coming quickly these days, it it keeps them from blowing over and hitting your house. Okay. Um, and one more question about oaks. Um, if you wanted to create a small garden underneath an oak um, for their leaves to slowly decay and add additional plants to the garden, um, how would you do that so that you wouldn't harm the roots of the oak? Uh, well, I would use a ground cover. Uh, first of all, consider the fact that your, your, the canopy of your oak is gonna get pretty big. So this is a mistake I've made. I put viburnums and azaleas and things that like acidity under my oaks, uh, but the canopy has, has grown over them and totally shaded them. Um, so you wanna put it out near the edge of that canopy so they actually get a little bit of sun. But any of the other ground covers, your spring ephemerals, um, native pachysandra, you know, the foam flower, there's a whole slew of them uh, that would, it's not going to compete with with the, the the trees' roots, 
you don't want to put it right up against the trunk of the tree. Again, give them a little bit of, of space. And if you have just plain leaf litter close to the tree, that's okay. That's totally normal. Uh, and your, your prettier plants will be out where people can see them. Um, Kelly would like to ask about what is killing so many mature oaks and how we can prevent it. Well, we brought in several diseases. We've got oak leaf scorch, bacterial leaf scorch. We've got um, oak wilt. Uh, uh, farther west, there's there's uh, sudden oak death syndrome. Uh, and, you know, they're here. We brought them here. They're here. So it's too late to prevent it. What's going to happen is that uh, a number of our oaks are susceptible. They're going to die. They are dying. But not all of them are susceptible. There is resistance out there. I'm seeing it right on my property. I've lost a couple of black oaks, but there's a number that look, look good. And those are the oaks that are going to produce the acorns that the blue jays will spread that will, will um, over time, replace those ones that are susceptible. We've got to get rid of those susceptible genes. This is called adaptation, uh, and it's going to take a while. But uh, I've heard people say, don't plant any oaks because they're going to die. Well, not all of them are going to die. And I say plant more oaks than ever so we can find out the ones that are susceptible and, and replace those ones that are, that are not susceptible and replace the ones that, that are. That's true with any of the diseases we, we have out there. Okay. I think the dogwoods have sort of shown that. Yes. Yeah. Good example. Good example. Um, Cheryl referred to the nature of the rainforest by Adrian Forsyth and how the same argument is used. She also asks about the availability of homegrown national park signage. Uh, she has Audubon National Wildlife and Baywise and would like to have something similar. Right. Well, if you go to our website, there is a, uh, there's a sign on there that you can print out. <laughs> we don't sell signs our, ourselves. Uh, we're, we're tiny at this point, but, okay. it, but you can uh, print the sign out and then reproduce it yourself. Um, Rebecca uh, says, what natives are viable under black walnut trees? Uh, most of them are viable under black walnut trees. The ones that are, that are susceptible are basically our, our um, ericaceous plants. So I wouldn't put azaleas uh, or any of the ericaceous blueberries things under black walnuts. They don't like that. But, um, you know, I've got black walnuts all over my property that the squirrels keep moving around and there are plants <laughs> under them. <laughs> so, you know, the notion that it's going to kill all your plants, that's simply not true. But, it, but there are some species, particularly those ericaceous plants, that are susceptible. Right. Um, do we have any more questions? Any, any more thoughts that you want to have? Does, does, is are the plants in Maryland substantially different than Pennsylvania? We're all in the Piedmont, but. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no. You know, Maryland, Western Maryland has its mountains just like Pennsylvania does. And, and uh, they're a little bit different, but uh, not much. Right. Uh, so let's talk about uh, plant provenance. When you're, when you're finding plants for your yard, the, the provenance is the most important thing. Um, getting a plant from someplace else like of, of a native species, it's not going to hurt the food web. So for example, if I plant a beech tree, things that eat beech can eat beech from Florida or Canada or Missouri. They don't care where it's from because the beaches are very similar. What's different is the, the genetics that allow that plant to thrive where you are. That's the provenance that we're talking about. So it's important to uh, match uh, the plants you're getting with with the you know the the altitude and the longitude and the and the soil type um, that you have in your yard, they will they will thrive. But you know it's if you if you goof up, it won't thrive, and maybe it'll even die. That's okay. Just plant another one. It's right. people get so uptight about it. You know, do the best you can, and it'll be good enough. What about the third rail of uh, plants, the species versus cultivar uh, argument? Um, I know that people will say cultivars, it's just, you know, certain colors and um, if they have more pe petals in their flower. But are there any arguments for really just staying with just species? Well, you're, you're certainly safe straying, staying with the straight species because we know they work. But there, there, um, 
first of all, there are a lot of cultivars that have come from nature. People found a variant, a genetic variant in nature, like uh, um, Acer yeah. Ruben October glory, glory, you know, the really red maple in the fall. That's a natural variant that was found out there. Uh, and they put a cultivar name on and, and sell it as October glory. And there's a lot of those like that. But particularly with flowers, there have been selections where we've selected, we've made zinnias look, or, or echinaceas look like zinnias and, you know, just trying to create a new look so that people will buy it each, each year. The question is, are they as productive as the straight species? And the answer is, it depends on what was, what was changed. Right. We did a study and the only, the only trait that decreased insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because that loads the leaf with anthocyanins, which are feeding deterrents. Um, making a tall plant short or, or increasing berry size or increasing uh, fall color, um, introducing disease resistance, which is a common cultivar, that didn't impact insect use at, at all. Uh, now, now, we didn't look at flowers anyway. The University of Vermont did look at flowers and the, the news isn't as good there. When you change flower shape or structure, you're messing with that specialized relationship with the specialist pollinators that that um, adapted to that particular flower and all of its peculiarities. When you change that, uh, it it really does threaten to mess up that relationship. Um, what is the? Well, okay, that's a repeat question. Uh, how do you know if a plant was grown with neonics, and how do we know if they have them? Well, you have to trust your the seller. You got to right. trust your nurserymen. Um, you don't know. I mean, you can't look at it. You can't taste it. Uh, neonics last quite a, quite a long time. Um, so for for perennials, things like like milkweeds, it can be a real problem. If you buy a um, a plug, and it's been grown with neonics, it could kill the monarchs all that year. Oh, um, okay. Now the following, they don't last forever. So eventually right. it will grow out of it. But the easiest thing is to find a, a supplier that really doesn't use them. Right. Um, is there any school related uh, related with the uh, HNP? Not yet, not okay. yet. But um, we do, uh, we're actually thinking about offering an online course. Um, you know, I talk about what we need to do, but I don't say a whole lot about how to do it. And yeah. a friend of mine has written an, a 250 page manual about how to do all of these things. We want to get that published. She wants to teach this online course. It'll be a great training manual for the ecological landscapers that we've got to populate the place with. Everybody wants to hire somebody, but most people don't have this knowledge. It's not very hard, but there's a lot of, you know, a lot of nuances to it. So eventually we do want to get that up and up and running so that um, anybody can, can take this and learn how to do this stuff. Um, any thoughts about deer spray? Um, deer spray works temporarily until it rains and then you got to spray again. I've tried it and I get, I get bored real fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, does it affect the butterflies and the bees? Do they yeah. smell it? Um, nobody's looked at that that I know of, but it sure makes sense that it would. Insects yeah. find their host plants through through smell, through chemistry, okay. and if you yeah. change that smell, I can't. Yeah, you know, I would. I would think they're not going to be able to recognize it. So, okay. Um, if you're if it's good with you, I'll give you one more question. Um, sure. How do you convert two acres, four acres, whatever of lawn to native landscape without either spending a fortune or uh, completely exhausting yourself? Well, we, we converted 10 acres. Now it wasn't all in lawn, but um, you, you have to be patient. The easiest thing, particularly in this area, is to plant trees. Yeah. Plant trees and put a, a bed under each tree. If you add one tree a year, uh, you're, you're making a, a, you know, a, a big contribution. Um, the design of those trees, that's landscape design and it's totally up to you, but, but adding woody plants is the easiest thing to do. The hardest thing to do is to create a meadow. Everybody wants to just create a meadow right away and that's great, but it's the hardest thing to do. Right. So, um, uh, I would plant trees. I would pick at it, uh, and, and, uh, maintain what you have rather than trying to do it all at once, you know, 
getting rid of four acres of lawn in, in one year is a big deal. So, right. you know, and you're not going to get rid of four acres. Keep lawn is a cue for care. I talk about cutting it in half so that you've got swaths of lawn. You, this is where you walk through your property. It shows your neighbors that you understand what the culture is. Um, you keep the lawn that you, that you, uh, the lawn you keep, you keep it manicured, you, you mow it and then you can do whatever you want and people don't care. It's when we just stop doing everything that people get upset. Right. Well, I want to say thank you very much for coming here and, uh, talking with everyone, um, and all the work that you've done over the years. It's you been a welcome. pleasure. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you at other events. Okay. Good night, everybody.